front of you, we invite you to take that and turn to Galatians 5. That's page 1006 in the Pew Bible. Page 1006, Galatians chapter 5. <clears throat> that song uh, is a, does a good job of telling the story of what uh, this church is all about. It's all about Jesus Christ. And, um, you know, while we, we love our church and we love one another, and uh, we need, always need to keep in mind that we're here because of Jesus. We're here for Jesus. Uh, he's to have the preeminence. And, um, you know, I love a song like that right before the message because it puts us in our right perspective. Uh, we're here because of Jesus. And so I appreciate that message and song this morning. We're going to be looking at the final uh, fruit, if you would, the final flavor of the fruit of the Spirit this morning. And uh, that's found in Galatians 5. Let's look at verse 22 and 23. Galatians 5, 22 says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. When one is being led by the Spirit, these virtues, the fruit of the Spirit, will flow freely from them. Note the Bible does not say the fruits of the Spirit, plural. It does not say the fruit of the Spirit are. It's not that you'll have one of these or the other, but a believer in Jesus who's being led by the Spirit will produce or manifest these nine flavors, if you will. Because it's one fruit, it's been referred to the nine flavored fruit. You'll notice there's a verse at the end, or a phrase at the end of verse 23. It says, against such there is no law. And that phrase simply means you do not need the law to control a man who is led by the Spirit. You do not need the law to control the man who is led by the Spirit. And verse 18 would testify to such. It says there, but if ye be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. And so keep in mind that the law is not evil, the law is not bad. The law is simply there to direct us to the fact that we could never reach God's holy standard and we need something else. And that something is actually someone and it's Jesus Christ. And once you're born again and you have the Holy Spirit of God dwelling within you, which every believer does, it is our aim in life to be led by the Spirit of God. And when we are, we don't need the law to control us anymore. Because the Spirit will lead us. We've said in the past an illustration of being led by the Spirit is like a baseball glove. If you'll remember that. And if we were to take an old baseball glove this morning and uh, one that's broken in, it would be very flimsy. It would be very easy to move by the person whose hand was inside of it. And we as believers in Jesus want to be like an old baseball glove. We want to be flimsy and, and ready to move by the Spirit which indwells us. So... At his impulse, we'll move. Uh, we don't want to be like a brand new baseball glove, which is stiff and often doesn't work very well when you're on the baseball field, and it's hard to comply with. We want to be a broken in, a broken piece of clay in the hands of, of the Lord. And we want him to be able to use us as he sees fit. Now, spiritually, when we get saved, as we said, the Spirit indwells us, and we are to be led and filled by the Spirit. And today we're going to look at this final virtue in this list the second word in verse 23, the word temperance. Temperance. Now, temperance is keeping our flesh under control by His Spirit. Temperance is keeping our flesh under control by His Spirit. The question this morning could be, well, what is the flesh? We hear that's a church word, right? The flesh is a church word. That's a Bible. What does that mean to me? Well, the flesh is what we want to do what our impulses are, our natural impulses, uh, to take what doesn't belong to us, uh, to say words that wouldn't be profitable, uh, to lust after someone. Uh, those are some of the things that our flesh would want us to do, our flesh would draw us to do. Our flesh likes to look out for itself and get whatever it wants. And so as a believer in Jesus and one who's led by the Spirit, this fruit of temperance will flow through us if we're led by the Spirit. We want to be controlled by the Spirit of God. Now this morning, this is not going to be a self-help, step-by-step program on how to beat our bad habits. 
You know, there's a lot of programs out there, and some of those work to help people uh, push aside bad hub habits and things that they've gotten themselves into. There's some programs out there that can help people get out of them, and that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. In fact, a lot of unsaved people, a lot of people who don't have the Holy Spirit dwelling in them, can find ways to control themselves most of the time. And we're not talking about that today. What we're talking about today is when our flesh wars against our spirit, and when our our, na our nature, what we want to do, fights against what God wants us to do and how that God can win that battle. So we want the Spirit to win those battles in our lives. We can't say this morning that we want to be, be led by the Spirit and then continue to make decisions based on what we want. We have to be led by the Spirit. Uh, this isn't hocus-pocus, as we say sometimes. It's not some special tingling feeling that you get. As much as it is paying attention, listen, to the person of the Holy Spirit as he directs us. Now, it's just like this. If we were to have somebody follow us around 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and whisper directions to us in life, that's what it would be like to be led by the Spirit. Um, because he does that. He indwells us. And he does have direction for us. He does have a will for us. There are things that he wants us to do. And this morning, we're going to see how we can be more cognitive, how we can be listening, how we can be aware of his direction in our life. I've seen many times when I was a young person, uh, one of my youth uh, workers, his name was Greg Wilkins. And uh, when I was in junior high, he would teach Sunday school in our Sunday school class. And I can still see him. He'd call one of us up to the front of the classroom there. And uh, he'd stand behind us. And he'd put his hands on our shoulders. And he would give us an illustration of what it was like to have the Holy Spirit speaking. And he, would give us, he always gave the instance of walking into the school cafeteria. And there'd be somebody by themselves. And he would, he'd put his hand on their shoulders. And he'd say, see that guy over there? See that girl over there sitting by themselves? Maybe you ought to go over there and be a friend of them. Maybe you ought to go over there and tell them about Jesus and maybe invite them to the youth activity. And he would always do that as an illustration of how it would be to have the Holy Spirit of God speaking to us. And boy, that came alive to me even as a junior hire. It really made sense what it is to have God speaking to our hearts. And just like if we had somebody who literally came up beside us for every decision of every day and whispered the right thing in our ear, boy, wouldn't that be wonderful? Wouldn't that be great, you know, to have somebody just tell us what to do? If you tell me what to do, I'll do it, you know. The fact of the matter is, we have that. We do. And, uh, you know, boy, I've never heard that. It's, it's a struggle sometimes. But we're going to see it in the, word of God, in the Word of God today, how we can be more aware of the leading of the Holy Spirit in our life so that we can exhibit His fruit of temperance. This morning, temperance is control of oneself. And that fruit flows through one who is led by the Spirit. Would those who see me and know me best say that I exhibit temperance? I think, first of all, this morning there are some questions we need to ask. It's just like if we were to go to our doctor because we had some things going on. Uh, we could begin to sit and tell our doctor, well, I'm having pain here or this doesn't feel right. But you know what that doctor is eventually going to start to do? He's going to start to ask questions because the best way to diagnose our health and even our spiritual health is to ask some questions about what's going on. So I think it's, it's right for us this morning to ask some questions about being led by the Spirit. How do I know if he's trying to lead me? How do I know when he is? How do I know when he's speaking? First of all, have I invited him to lead me? Have I invited him to lead me? Say, so do you have to invite him? I don't know, but I know this. It helps me to be more aware of it when I do. It helps me to be more aware when I say, Lord, I want you to control me and lead me today. Just to say it out loud makes a difference. So have we invited him to lead us? Because you know he's, he's not going to just control us. So have we invited him to, to lead us? Next, have I chosen to wait for his promptings and then to yield to them? Have I chosen to wait for his promptings and then to yield to his promptings? Have I made a conscious effort to do that? And next, 
Have I attempted to be more sensitive to his leading? To be more aware that he's with me everywhere I go? Have I attempted to be more sensitive to his leading? The first thing we'll notice this morning, the Bible instructs us to walk in the Spirit. We're talking about temperance. How can I control me? How can I control my desires? How can I control my lust? How can I control my mouth? How can I control my appetites? When we're led by the Spirit, we'll have temperance. And so this morning we'll notice first the Bible says we need to walk in the Spirit. You're in Galatians 5. Let's just go up a few verses to verse 16. Galatians 5, verse 16. It says, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust lust of the flesh. Let's pray this morning. Our Father, we come to you now to the Word of God. And Lord, we ask that you would, in a real way, um, begin to speak to our hearts today. Lord, we do invite you to move today. We do invite you to challenge our hearts. Lord, personally, we want you to do something in our individual lives. Lord, I pray that you would be real to us today, that we would know that we have met with you today. And Lord, that when we leave this place, maybe as we're eating lunch or this afternoon as we're resting, we'll look back and know that we met with you today because we saw and felt things that only you can do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Verse 16, this I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And then then it goes on to explain something we feel all the time, but maybe we don't know how to put it into words. Look at verse 17. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. You know, it's hard to put that right there into words sometimes, but God did it for us. Have you ever had that time in your life when, and it should happen daily, when we have a warring inside of us, where we have something that we want to do, but we sense that God would not have us to do that. Or we have something that we don't want to do, and we sense that God would have us to do something. And that's exactly what verse 17 is talking about, is that war that goes on inside of us where our flesh wars against our spirit. God living in me wars against me and my natural desires. That's a good thing, by the way. If you notice that going on in your life, that's a wonderful thing because that means you're born again and the spirit of God is in you. And that's a good thing. And so this morning, as it says, there is a war that goes on and it tells us in verse 16 that we're to walk in the spirit. And if we do that, we won't do our natural lusts. What does it mean to walk in the Spirit? Well, first of all, when we walk in the Spirit, our life will look differently than the average person around us. Maybe not the average Christian, hopefully not the average Christian. But as we go to work and we uh, interact with people who aren't born again, our life should look different than theirs if we're walking in the Spirit. Now, it's not due to the flesh, the strength of our flesh, but this occurs as we turn over control to the Holy Spirit of God. Walking in the Spirit will be a walk that's biblical. It'll be a walk that's biblical. And here's how we know that. You don't need to turn there, but Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 17, when it talks about the whole armor of God, it says this, And take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Listen, we're instructed to take the sword of the Spirit. The sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. And if I'm walking in the Spirit, I'm going to be walking according to the Word of God. It goes hand in hand. Our involvement in the Word of God will be directly related to the extent of our walk in the Spirit. Our involvement in the Word of God will be directly related to our walk in the Spirit. As we study the Word, as it convicts our hearts, as it challenges us when we read it, as it convicts us when we read it, as it encourages us as we read and study the Bible, it will affect our walk 
It has to because it's the sword of the Spirit. It's His weapon. And He will do His work in our life because His word is quick and powerful than any two-edged sword. And it pierces to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and the, the thoughts and the intents of the heart. As we know this word and we are in this word, it will make a difference in our walk. Amen? And I hope this morning it's our goal and it's our desire to be more and more in the Word so our walk will be different. Studying the Word is vitally important to us walking in the Spirit. And when we do that, when we study the Word of God, and we eat it, and we drink it, and we meditate upon it, temperance will be inserted as the fruit of the Spirit. It will be produced in our life. Temperance is control of oneself. And that fruit flows through one who is led by the Spirit. Would those I spend most of my time with say that I exhibit temperance? The second thing this morning, if you would turn to Romans chapter 6, please. Romans chapter 6, that's page 972 in the Pew Bible. Page 972, Romans 6. First thing we notice is we need to walk in the Spirit. If we're going to produce or exhibit this fruit of temperance, we need to walk in the Spirit. And that begins with a walk in the Word. And secondly, this morning, we're going to see here in Romans chapter 6 and verse 13 that we need to choose to yield to the Holy Spirit. Romans chapter 6, verse 13. It says, Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. Notice those words. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin. So the first thing it tells us, don't yield yourself to sin. Don't use your body, don't use your, your voice, don't use your mind, don't use your resources for the sake of sin and wrong. It tells us to, to do that. Don't, don't turn our control over to sin. And then it says in the second part of that verse, but yield yourselves unto God. Because as we yield ourselves to God, we, our bodies, our voices, our minds will become instruments of righteousness and right doing, and right things. Will we choose to yield to the Holy Spirit? Now, when we think of yielding, I think the obvious example is the yield in, in the road. And we see a yield sign, the upside-down triangle. And it has the, maybe the red stripe around it, and it says yield. And I know that many times there are yellow signs as well. But when we talk about yielding, maybe we'll notice those, or we'll think about those yield signs on the road. And when we're directed to yield... Hopefully we all know what that means, especially those of us who are over 16. When we see a yield sign that's directed toward us, we are to let the other cars that are trying to share that access, that road, we are to let them go first. We are to yield to them. Let them have it first, and then we go when there's nothing else coming. That's how it's supposed to work. Um, if we're in a hurry, sometimes we don't yield, and, and there could be bad things happen. But yielding to the Spirit is the same way. Yielding to the Holy Spirit is the same way. In life, when I come to a decision, hopefully we see a big yield sign, right? And you say, I see a fork in the road. Well, hopefully we see a yield sign. And we'll see that sign and we'll say, Lord, what would you have me to do? And we find ourselves there, don't we? We pray about decisions all the time. Many times people here at the church will send me an email or a text or they'll meet me after service and say, Pastor Keller, would you pray for me? I have a big decision coming up. And of course, I'm glad to pray for folks. And, and people here, you know that I've asked you to pray for me as I'm making decisions and things like that. But listen, it's wonderful to have people pray for us. It's wonderful to pray about decisions. But how do we know? 95% of the time, how do we know what to do when we come to a yield? The Word of God tells us. The, the answer is in the Word. It's a principle that's found in the Word of God. It's a direction that's given by the Word of God. And we come to a yield sign. We are to let the Holy Spirit take control. Yielding to the Spirit. 
Some people say surrender to the Spirit of God. Surrender, in my mind, means that I have no other choice, so I have to give up. I don't like it that way. I don't like to think of it in those terms. I like what the Bible says, to yield, allowing control, giving control over, handing. You go first. We're all instructed to yield. Did you see that? It's not that you're going to come to a decision and say, I wonder if God wants me to yield. No, 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 no. Look at verse 13, second part. But yield yourselves unto God. There's no doubt about it. God wants us to yield to him. You say, maybe this one time, God really wants me to do what I want to do. No, no, no. He says to yield ourselves unto him. And that's the best advice we could take. When we yield to God, we may not get it our way. It may not be what we wanted, but it'll be God's way. And it'll be righteousness. Did you see the product of that at the end of verse 13? And your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. As we yield to him, it'll be for his glory and for right. Now, if we are on the road and we come to a yield sign and we decide that our access is more important than the person coming, and we go on through, we can get ourselves into a mess, can't we? We can have an accident. I don't know if it's much of an accident if you choose to do it, but anyway, you can get into a car wreck if you choose not to yield. Guess who's at fault? The person that blew through the yield sign. And listen, we ought to yield to the Holy Spirit because when I yield to Him, I can stand before God with a clear conscience. It may not be what I wanted. It may not be how I wanted things to turn out. I might have been late for the program because I yielded, you know. But, I'll be whole. <laughs> Yielding is important for us as believers. Listen, the Holy Spirit's not going to just, like a video game, control your life. Like Pac-Man, you know. We have to give ourselves over to Him. And die to ourselves. You know, as we're thinking about yielding this morning, I wonder if there's somebody here today who you're not saved yet. You know, you've been thinking about it for a couple weeks or maybe months, maybe years. God's been speaking to your heart about, hey, you know you need to be saved. You know you need to yield and trust Jesus. And maybe this morning, right now, the Holy Spirit of God is saying to you, you need to be saved. You need to trust Jesus. Maybe he's whispering that to your heart right now. And did you know in just a few minutes you'll be able to yield to him? You'll be able to come down that aisle and say, Preacher, I want to yield to the Holy Spirit. I want to be saved this morning. I want to trust Jesus Christ as my Savior. Today could be the day where the first time in your life you yield to God and let Him have control. We'll all be better when God has control. And maybe this morning God would be speaking to your heart about being saved. You know, temperance is control of oneself. And that fruit flows through one who is led by the Spirit. Would those that I spend most of my time with say that I exhibit temperance? Third and finally this morning, if you would turn to Acts chapter 10 with me, please. Acts chapter 10, that's page 946. Acts 10, page 946. We've seen that we need to walk in the Spirit. And we do that as we walk in the Word. The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Do we spend time in His Word? Do we walk in His Spirit? Secondly, we saw that we need to yield to his spirit. Are we willing to yield to God? And third and finally this morning here in Acts chapter 10, we're going to see that we need to attempt to be more sensitive to the Holy Ghost's leading. Attempt to be more sensitive to the Holy Ghost's leading. Acts chapter 10, beginning in verse 17. Peter had just seen a vision from God, and now here it gives us his thoughts. Acts 10, 17. Now while Peter doubted in himself what this vision which he had seen should mean, behold, the men which were sent from Cornelius had made inquiry for Simon's house and stood before the gate and called and asked whether Simon, which was surnamed Peter, were lodged there. While Peter thought on the vision, here it is, the Spirit said unto him, Behold, three men seek thee. Arise therefore and get thee down and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. And you'll notice the first words of verse 21, then Peter went down to the men. So we see there, the Holy Spirit is leading Peter to go. 
The Holy Spirit has said to him, go, and we see that he goes. Now maybe just turn a page over there in your Bible to chapter 11, Acts chapter 11. Peter is retelling the story about what happened, and notice the words he uses this time. Acts 11, 12, Acts chapter 11, verse 12. Notice the words. He's retelling, and he says, verse 12, And the Spirit bade me go with them, nothing doubting. Moreover, these six brethren accompanied me, and we entered into the man's house. Do you, do you notice that word there? And the Spirit bade me to go with them. You know what? The Spirit is going to lead in our lives if we let him. He, listen, God has a will for us. He sure does. And he has a, a plan for us. And I'm not just talking about the big overall plan of our life, but in all of our interactions, in all of our days, God has a plan for us. He has a way that he wants us to do things. And he will lead if we're willing to listen. You say, Brother Keller, why wouldn't you put this before yielding? Because don't you have to be sensitive before you can yield? Well, I don't know. I think you have to be willing to yield or else it doesn't matter. <laughs> if we're not willing to yield, he can talk all he wants and it's not going to matter. So the issue of yielding needs to come first. First of all, am I going to be willing just to yield to God? Yes or no? That's the first thing. And then if we say, yes, Lord, I want to yield to you and we're sincere in our hearts, then we need to begin to listen because he will speak. And he, as he spoke to Peter, he will speak to us. It's a conscious choice we make to yield and to be sensitive or not. How do we know if God is speaking? How do I know if God's speaking to me? Well, if you would just flip back to Acts 10, we'll see that Peter put himself in a position for God to speak to him. Look at Acts chapter 10, verse 9. This is before God spoke to Peter. Look what it says, Acts 10, 9. On the morrow, as they went on their journey and drew nigh into the city, Peter went up upon the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. See, Peter put himself in a position to hear from God. He went up on the housetop while they were making lunch. He went up on the housetop to get away from the noise. He went up on the housetop to get away from the voices because there was one thing he needed to do at that time, and that was to be with God. You know what, friend? If the first thing we hear in the morning is talk radio or our music and we allow all these voices, and I'll even say this, the Twitters and the Facebooks, we allow all these influences and then at the end of the day we say, okay, Lord, I got five minutes before I conk. We're not going to have much sensitivity to a spirit. We need to allow the voice of God its rightful place in our life. We need to maybe start our day with God. I've heard many people say as I went through seminary, and I don't think it's just good for preachers, I think it's good for all Christians, give your morning time to God. And maybe for you that's 10 minutes. Give it to God. Maybe you have a little bit more time than that. Give it to God. Maybe on your drive to work you would turn off the radio and you'd put the phone away. You ought to have the phone away anyway if you're driving. But you'd put the phone away and you'd turn the radio off and you would take that time and just let God's voice speak to you that morning. Get some time with God. Get alone with God because then we, we put ourselves in a position to hear from him. He did speak to Elijah on the mount. He didn't speak in an earthquake. He didn't speak in a tornado. He didn't speak in the wind. He didn't speak in the fire. How did he speak? You tell me. In a still, small voice. He's not going to scream over all the other voices. He's not going to shout over our music. He's not going to erase the Facebook page and pop up on your screen. He speaks in a still, small voice. The illustration has been given. Before there were refrigerators, people used ice houses to preserve their food. Does anybody remember that? I'm just kidding. <laughs> Maybe some of you do. I don't know. People used to use ice houses to preserve their food. Ice houses had thick walls, no windows, and a tightly fitted door. In winter, when streams and lakes were frozen, they would go out and cut out large blocks of ice and haul them to these ice houses and cover them in sawdust. And oftentimes, the, saw, the, the ice would last into the summer. Well, one time, he, a man went into the, an ice house and he lost a very valuable watch while working in there. 
And he searched diligently for it and couldn't find it. And he got a bunch of his friends and they went into the ice house and they all scraped through the, through the uh, sawdust to try to find it. And no one could find his watch. He was distraught. Well, there was a little guy standing outside and just a little boy. And he heard the, the chaos of everybody wanting to find this watch. And he thought, well, I'll give it a shot. And he went into the ice house and closed the door and laid down. Didn't move. And listened. And as he heard the faint tick, 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 it led him to the watch. Well, he came out with the watch and found it, and they were all just astonished and said, how in the world did you find that? And he said, I just listened. Isn't that like us? Sometimes we're looking for something. We want to hear from God, and man, we're, we're peeling through Facebook and Twitter, and we're looking through the newspaper, and we find every Christian magazine and book that we can, and all oh, this is going to be the one... And sometimes, most of the time, when we want to hear from God, let's get quiet. Get alone. Get in this book. And listen for a still, small voice. Because he will lead. He will lead. If we'll let him. If you'd stand with me, please, and our musicians would come. Temperance, control of oneself by his spirit. In his word, the sword of the spirit, we find how to walk in his spirit. How is our time in the word of God? Do we give it enough time to affect our walk? Do we yield to his control? Am I, <clears throat> am I even willing to let God take over? Are we listening for his still, small voice? Do we ever get still enough and quiet enough to let God get our heart? This morning, as Brother Tim sings, maybe you need to make a decision <clears throat> for the first time to yield to God and trust Jesus Christ as your Savior. As Brother Tim sings,